I'd like to join in with uh, John in welcoming everyone to our worship assembly this morning. I'm certainly glad to be here, and I know you share those sentiments as well. We're here to worship God together, and that should always fill our hearts with joy and happiness as we're gathered together. As you recall, a few weeks ago, at the beginning of the year, the elders and I got together in a meeting and we decided to present a particular theme to the congregation. A theme that we could consider and study and learn about in the present year. So each month we'll be presenting one lesson and maybe other activities as well around the theme of think of the home over there. Thinking of the home over there provides many wonderful blessings for us as Christians. It reminds us of many of the blessings that we have in God as we look forward to heaven, that home over there. So today's lesson is based upon that theme. We're going to be talking about the concept of actually thinking about the home over there. The first lesson that was delivered on this topic that John delivered at the beginning of the year, he mentioned several things about heaven that we look forward to. We're not going to be naming those particular things or discussing those things that describe heaven or that characterize heaven this morning. We're going to be simply talking about the subject of thinking about and the blessings that are ours simply to take time to think and meditate upon heaven. God gave us the ability to think about things, life in general, decisions that we make, what's right and wrong, and so on and so forth, including heaven. And we want to make sure we spend time in our life thinking about heaven. I'd like for you to turn with me, if you would, back to the very beginning. The book of Genesis, chapter 1 tells us that man was made in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 says, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Verse 26 points out that as God created man in his own image, he gave him dominion over the fish of the sea, over all the other things that God had created. This instruction, this command, was given to Adam. And Adam recognized that command. He thought about it and put it into practice. Over in chapter 2, in verse uh, 19 and 20, it says, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. When Adam took upon himself to name all the different beasts of the field and the birds and so forth that God had commanded him to name, he was reflecting an understanding, a mental acceptance of that command and of the expectation that God had of him. So God created man in his image. He created man with a mind. And that mind allows man to think about the commands that God gives us to consider when and where they apply, and then to go forth and obey those commands. And that's exactly what Adam did. He was using his mind. He was thinking also about what God said. There's no doubt about that. There was another command given by God in reference to what they were allowed to eat in the garden. In verse 15 of chapter 1, or chapter 2 of Genesis, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but 
On the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Well, that was another command God gave to Adam and Eve, a command they expected them to think about, to consider, and to apply, to obey. She understood that, Eve did, over in chapter 3, in verse 1 beginning, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, As God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, for nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So again, a command given by God to Adam and Eve, completely understood by Adam and Eve. She reflected that understanding when she responded to the uh, question of, of uh, Satan, asking her you know, what God commanded them to do. So she understood. She expressed a, a comprehension of that command. She didn't obey it. She used her mind to make a decision. And she made the wrong decision. But the idea I'm making here is that God gave us a mind. He gave us a revelation. And we are to use our minds to consider, to think, to meditate upon His revelation, and then to go forth and obey what He's commanded us to do. Over in 1 Kings chapter 4, in verse 29, I want to consider this passage that has to do with King Solomon and the wisdom that God gave him. Again pointing out that the wisdom that he enjoyed was a gift from God. God gave Solomon a mind and God filled that mind with great wisdom. Look at 1 Kings chapter 4 in the 29th verse. And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Then thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men. So God, again in reference to his gift to mankind, his gifts include a mind. He gives our mind, he gives us whatever level of wisdom we have, and expects us to use that wisdom. Solomon had great wisdom, exceedingly great wisdom, and again his extra wisdom above that which most men enjoy, any other man, was uh, given to him by God as a gift. Also in chapter 10 and verse 24 of 1 Kings, it says, Now all the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom which God put in his heart. So there is a verse that says specifically, that this wisdom that Solomon had was given to him by God, put into his heart. God's gift to Solomon on this occasion was great wisdom, with which he filled the mind of Solomon. Turn over to 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 9. 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 9, we have yet another reference to the wisdom of God. 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and the ninth verse, says, And as for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father, and serve him with a loyal heart, and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts, and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. This instruction given to Solomon, again refers to the wisdom that he had. He also had a loyal heart. He is commanded to serve God with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. This is another element that goes along with the mind that God has given to us. If we're going to hear God's commands and obey his commands, we have to have what Solomon is uh, admonished to have here, and that is a loyal heart and a willing mind. Our mind that God's given us, a gift from God, the brain that He's placed within us to think with, to consider with, to make decisions with, must be willing, it must be amenable to God's commands. 
because the Lord searches our hearts. He understands all the intents of the heart. If we seek Him, He will be found by you, but if you forsake Him, He will cast you off together. So the proposition is there delivered to us by way of Solomon's example that we can either reject or obey God's commandments. We use our mind to make a decision. Are we going to obey or not obey? But again, it's a mind that God has given to us. And throughout the scripture, we see direct and indirect references to the fact that God has given us a mind to use in obedience to Him, to reflect our attitude toward Him, our respect toward Him, our honor toward Him, our respect for His Word. Whether or not we're going to use our minds to obey Him in a positive way or disregard His Word is up to us. And then God will respond in the accurate, fair way. But we must recognize our duty to appreciate God's blessing in this respect and use the blessings of our mind, our thinking capacity to glorify God and live in obedience to Him. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 23 over in the New Testament points out the same proposition. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 23, Jesus was turning to Peter. He said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. So Peter upon this occasion was not mindful. He was not using his mind to think about things in a godly perspective. He was thinking of things from a worldly perspective in reference to the things of men. So again, this admonishes us to use our mind to think about things the way God has instructed us. He wants us to glorify Him. We need to have a willing mind versus an unwilling or re rebellious mind. We need to have a godly mind rather than a mind of man. And so we can take these admonitions. So thinking about the mind that God has given us, the opportunity to use our minds to think, to meditate, to consider, to make decisions with, I think we need to spend more time thinking about these spiritual things. You know, we spend time thinking every day about work, about what we're going to eat, about what we're going to wear, about driving, about the chores around the house or our work. The weather, all of these things we spend time thinking about. But there are more noble things to occupy our thoughts than these everyday matters. Everyday matters are important. But we need to meditate and consider things of a spiritual or heavenly nature. Make time in our schedule to think about God. To think about things that are worthy of our thoughts. If you would turn over to the book of Philippians, in chapter 4. In verse 8, Follow me, my brethren, Paul says, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. There are some examples right there of things we need to think about that we don't think about every day. Think about things that are noble, that are true, that are just, that are pure, that are lovely, that are of good report, that are virtuous, that are praiseworthy. How much time do we spend using the mind that God has given to us thinking about these worthy, virtuous qualities and characteristics? We can think about them when we're driving, when we're getting ready in the morning, when we're at work, to some extent. We can think about these noble things during the day if we simply set our minds to it and concentrate upon thinking of things that are more noble. We see the same thing over in Colossians chapter 3. Turn over probably just one page in your Bibles and look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, which says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now this gets to the specific point of my lesson today. 
to think about things which are above, to think about our home over there, to think about heaven, because heaven is our home over there. So we're going to talk about things we need to think about. In particular, think about the home over there. First of all, and just don't pay attention to that direction, the last point there, it escaped. But here we want to think about worldly things, or heavenly things, godly things, worthwhile things, such as those we read about there in uh, uh, Philippians chapter 4 or Colossians chapter 3. And the one thing we want to think about in reference to uh, heaven, because when we think about heaven, as I mentioned at the introduction of our lesson, thinking about heaven has blessings and holds blessings in and of itself. We don't have to think about the qualities of heaven or what heaven is actually going to be like. We describe those things uh, that are going to be there. We can be blessed simply by thinking about heaven. What are some of the blessings that we receive simply by meditating on or thinking about or contemplating or pondering heaven? First of all, comfort and reassurance. We can receive comfort and reassurance when we think about heaven. When we think about what God has done for us, during times of adversity, such as those in which we're living today, when we're uncertain about what the future holds, God wants to set our minds at ease. And He gives us comfort and reassurance when we think about the home that we have in heaven. In uh, 1 Corinthians, rather, 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 4, as the Apostle Paul was concluding his discussion about the uh, resurrection and about those saints that had passed on, he comforted the brethren there in Thessalonica with words where he described the resurrection in heaven. And when he talked about their resurrection in heaven, that they would enjoy subsequently, to their resurrection, they were expected to be comforted and reassured by those words. Read with me, if you will. Beginning in verse 13, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now notice the last verse there, verse 18. Therefore comfort one another with these words. The concepts of the resurrection in heaven to be enjoyed by these saints that were still living to whom Paul was writing, as well as to the saints who had passed away already, was a source of joy and comfort and consolation. They were reassured in this discussion about heaven that they had faith in. And Paul was simply reasserting his belief and reassuring their faith in heaven when this life is over. So there you have a reference there to words describing our, revel our resurrection and entrance into heaven. And they to you and I today are truly words of comfort and reassurance. So if you're having problems, difficulties, struggles in your life today, troubles you don't have any control over, that may be bothering you to a great extent or a lesser extent, whatever. Think about heaven and allow that those thoughts of the eternal home that God has prepared for you to comfort and reassure you that this life is not going to last forever. Your troubles will soon be over. Your difficulties and struggles in this life will not last forever, but heaven will. And that very thought, just thinking about that, contemplating, meditating upon that thought, will reassure and comfort our souls. Secondly, a 
Another blessing that comes simply by thinking about heaven. Think about that home over there. Think about our eternal reward. Is that it increases or improves or perfects our perspective on life. Keeping our thoughts centered on our home in heaven provides a blessing of perspective. We need perspective. Our outlook is not only bright as Christians, not only positive, but our outlook or our perspective on life is accurate. David said in Psalm 119, verse 104, Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. There David again expressing the use of his mind in contemplating or meditating upon God's word. And from God's word, he not only knew what was right, but he also knew what was wrong. He had the right perspective on life. You know, most of the people in the world today do not have the right perspective. They don't know what's right or what's wrong. They might not even be assured in their own mind whether God exists or not. They don't know whether heaven exists or hell exists. They have no faith. They have no foundation. They have not a correct perspective of their life or what life is all about. You and I have that. We know what's right and wrong. We know what's true and false. We know what's good and bad. We know there's a God, we know there's a heaven, we know there's a devil, we know there's a hell. We know there's certain decisions we need to make in life that will reflect respect and obedience to God. We know there are things we need to stay away from. We have the right perspective in life as Christians. And thinking about heaven reminds us of that perspective. It reminds us that God has given that to us as a gift. So Psalm 119 verse 104 speaks of the understanding that God's people have of what is and what is not important in our lives. Heaven is one of those things that is important. Earthly and material things are not important. Turn over, if you would, to Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26. Right after that passage you read a few moments ago, moments ago in Matthew. Here in verse 26, Jesus says, What profit is it to a man if he gains a whole world and loses his own soul, but what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. This perspective that we have through God, through his word, through our acknowledgement and understanding and application of his word, gives us the blessing of knowing that there's nothing that we can exchange for our soul that will be worthwhile. Not even the entire world. So worldly things, including the earth itself, are not as important as our soul. We understand that. And if we understand that, we have faith in the fact, as verse 27 points out, that the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He will reward each according to His works. What is that reward? It's our eternal home in heaven. So we have this great blessing. When we think about heaven, we got to play and meditate upon heaven. We have comfort and reassurance. We have the right perspective. We understand that God is going to give us those things which we need. Thirdly, as is already before you on the uh, overhead, when we think about and contemplate heaven, we have yet another spiritual blessing, and that is direction. We have the right direction. We know which way to walk and how to live in our life. Thinking of our home over there provides us that blessing. You know, many people in this life do not know where they're going. They don't even know where they came from. They don't know where they're going either. They have no direction. Yet Christians are blessed with directions that are divinely inspired and divinely provided by God. Our direction is, as Psalm 23 and verse 3 points out, in the paths of righteousness. The paths of righteousness, that's the paths that we walk in. That gives us our direction. Our way is the straight paths of the Lord. Acts 13 and verse 10. Or Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 20 says that our direction, our path, are the paths of justice. 
Paul admonished Christians, saying in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 16, let us walk by the same rule. So there is a rule, there is a path that we need to walk. Jeremiah tells us it is not within man who walks to direct his steps. But God is the one who directs us. And we need to look to God through his word for direction, for the way to live, the path, the right pathway to walk. Our direction in life is provided by God. What a great blessing that is. Many people in the world who don't know how to live, who have no direction, are miserable people. They don't understand the blessing of following God's word. They, they scorn God's word. They ridicule and make fun of God's word, maybe people who follow up God's word, such as you and I. But they don't understand the blessing that comes from God's word. From meditating upon these things that are righteous and virtuous. To meditate upon heaven, our home over there. Because when we meditate upon those things, we understand the blessings that come from that meditation. We have the blessing of comfort and reassurance. We have the blessing of the right perspective, the accurate, correct perspective of life. And we have direction that will take us to that heavenly abode. And then finally, yet another blessing that we receive when we think about heaven, when we meditate on heaven, just maybe take a quiet moment or maybe 30 minutes in our home, turn off the television, put our cell phones down, and think about something other than the mundane uh, affairs of life. And think about heaven. Concentrate, meditate upon heaven. And you will also receive the blessing of knowing that heaven is your destination. If you're traveling somewhere, and everyone's traveling through life, whether they realize it or not, they're, they're moving in some direction. They may not understand the right direction or going in the right direction, but they're moving somewhere. As a Christian, we have a destination to look forward to. We know where we're going. And thinking about heaven reminds us, thinking of our home over there, our home in heaven, reminds us during difficult trials that we have the blessing of a destination. We know where our path in life is going to lead us. Paul said of his personal destination. He says in Philippians 3, verse 13 and 14, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Is not heaven among those prizes that he's thinking of here? Does that prize not include heaven? Jesus comforts our hearts as well in reference to heaven. In John chapter 14, in the first three verses, Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Our destination is heaven. So we ought to be spending a good deal of time thinking about and meditating about heaven, and at the same time thanking God for our minds, for the capacity that we have to think, to meditate on these wonderful spiritual blessings that we have in Jesus Christ, our Savior. To think about the ultimate goal, the ultimate reward of heaven, that we look, and look forward to that goal when this life is over. That's our destination. That's where we're going. And by faith in God, we will all get to that destination. Faith is a victory that overcomes the world. And that victory that will come in the world is the inheritance of heaven as our final reward of not perfect people, but of those whose sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus. In conclusion, are there not, therefore, many blessings to be enjoyed in thinking of our home over there? It is God who desires that his children take time to think, to meditate, to ponder, to contemplate heaven. And the time that we spend doing so will certainly be time well spent.
So I encourage you, that's the invitation to you today, for we're all Christians, to think about heaven, to contemplate the blessings that God has for us in heaven. And in that contemplation, in that meditation, in that thinking, think about the blessings that are ours in the process of thinking. They reassure us, they comfort us, they remind us of the correct, accurate perspective of life that we have through God's Word. They remind us of the fact that we are traveling in the right direction and that we are headed for the right destination, heaven, that home over there. We encourage you to think about these things as together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.